Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this uh, this panel, um, and we're really excited about uh, about the conversation today, um, which is looking at um, the role of women um, in aid in Afghanistan and aid from a from a gendered lens in Afghanistan. Um, so I think we all know the the issues, um, the top line issues um, with the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. More than half the population is in need of humanitarian aid. Um, there are really high levels of acute uh, food uh, insecurity. Um, women are less likely to have a balanced diet, and 100% of female-headed households aren't getting enough food to eat. Uh, there's a malnutrition crisis for children. Um, women are sidelined um, public life. There are restrictions on education, public sector work, restrictions on movement, and that contributes to the economic crisis, and econ employment losses have disproportionately hit women. Um, there's a healthcare crisis, as we all know. Um, more women will be denied healthcare if there aren't enough female staff, and that has obviously repercussions for today and the long term in Afghanistan. But women continue to work, they continue to lead, they continue to be active, and that includes in the humanitarian sector, as we'll hear about today. So, as we all know, the, I think the humanitarian community has a real dilemma here. Um, how does the emergency aid sector? including the Afghans who form the vast majority of aid staff in the country, how do they address these problems? Um, how do humanitarians meaningfully include Afghan women, not just as people who receive aid, but people who are actively involved in how aid works? Um, how do you negotiate access with the Taliban, who are the same people responsible for some of the restrictions that are in, that are in the headlines? Um, so Afghan women already have ideas for how to better address some of these problems, and we'll hear some of those ideas and talk about those today. Um, so I'd like to briefly introduce our four panelists, um, and then we'll talk a little bit, we'll get into the discussion. Um, so first, uh, we have Zora Wardak. She is the Director of Compliance, Ethics, and Gender at the International Rescue Committee in Afghanistan. She's also the co-leader of the Gender and Humanitarian Working Group. <laughs> we also have Mariam Safi who is a founding and executive director of the Organization for Policy Research and Development Studies, also known as DROPS. We have Sofia Ramya, who is a former executive director of Afghans for Progressive Thinking. She's also a law student at Pepperdine University. And we have Asila Wardak. She's a former Afghan diplomat and human rights activist. She's currently a fellow at Harvard University, where she is conducting research on girls' education and on the direct impact of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. So we'll we'll begin with the question each for each panelist. But first, I just want to quickly go over some logistics issues for for viewers. Um, if you're watching this session on the YouTube live stream, that's great. But if you'd like to participate and ask a question, uh, please join the Zoom session with the link that you may have because um, you can't pose a question on YouTube. So please join us on Zoom. Uh, for all participants, please uh, comment on Twitter using the hashtag HC Berlin. And we have some accessibility features with Zoom. Uh, there's live captioning, captioning into written English. We do have live translation into languages, including French and Dari. Uh, unfortunately, with Dari, uh, you'll have to click on German uh, for some reason. But uh, do click on that. There is that option available for live translation into Dari. Um, and you can to access all language uh, issues, just press the globe button, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And of course, if you're on Zoom, comments and questions can be posted in the Zoom Q&A window, and we'll try to get to, to some of those as many as we can during this hour. Um, okay, so there's that. I think we're ready to start. Um, I think we'll, we'll just start with one question each for each panelist to, to get an overview of where everyone's coming from, and then we'll, we'll explore some of these issues um, in a bit more detail over the course of the next hour. Um, so let's start with Zora Wardak with the IRC. Uh, Zora, uh, you'll be returning to Afghanistan shortly, I believe. Um, how would you describe the humanitarian situation now, um, especially for women as, as winter approaches? Sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, based on your location. Uh, since I was like uh, in Afghanistan a week ago, and now I'm going back to there, so we have seen the reality on the ground very closely. And uh, I would say that in 20 years, uh, the economy situation was not like good Afghanistan, who is one of the poorest countries in the world. And uh, 
uh, right now Afghanistan is experiencing crisis over the other crisis. So we have been experiencing shift in power and then after that, like flood, after that earthquake and cholera and these things. So looking to the uh, situation of the country people, it is uh, worse than ever. And uh, recently from whole of Afghanistan research, it has came out that the number of the people who are in need would not increase, but the severity will increase more than ever because of the people who had but who had the, like the assets and things so that has been spent during the time and now it is like finished so they don't have any other uh, resources available and um, of course we have been uh, s uh, s uh, witnessing the um, the women who are like struggling with to find uh, economic uh, opportunity for them like to generate income and that is something which is very limited for all afghan and it's like especially for afghan women and uh, whenever we have been like uh, have an opportunity from our uh, organization side to go to the field uh, offices and meet the afghan women in the rural areas so there is a different type of a problems of course economy is worse and the other the other thing which is uh, problematic for most of them is that men left the country because of the uh, limited economy opportunity and they are right now like left behind alone and they don't have any opportunity and uh, looking to the winter so that will like the double the problems and the challenges that they are facing uh, during the course of this year and uh, uh, when I was in Badlis province so there was an old a lady like uh, Maybe her age was 60 or 65. She had the family of 12 family members and her married daughters are also alone because their husbands has left the country and went to Iran for the for finding the job there. And uh, she was like um, baking the bread and the um, traditional oven. And that was like all her hands were burned out with those um but she was she didn't have any other option and she was still like responsible to take the responsibility of her children in the home and the married children which are also alone so looking to the whole uh, situation people are like the highest rate of people are unemployed and there was a study which has showed that 99% of a woman uh, of women are uh, it have confirmed that they don't have uh, food to eat, like enough food to eat per day. And uh, most of the time, it is the women who are eating the last if, the, if there is no enough food in the uh, country. And uh, uh, the people who, like after, before, they were able to, um, the people who were able to, support themselves and their families and had a dignified life are now completely aid dependent. And uh, sometimes this aid dependency is not something that they're really willing to receive it because they had a dignified life. And now, but they don't have any other option to save their lives and they are uh, just struggling and waiting for assistance to receive and then uh, survive. So the situation is worse and there is no doubt with the winter it will get more words. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. I think we'll come back to some of those issues um, shortly. Um, and thank you for raising this this issue of aid dependency, which is, I think, a theme that that, that many of you have talked about as well. Um, Mariam Safi, let's go to you next. Um, your organization has conducted surveys of Afghan women across 17 provinces, I believe. Um, women were asked their perspectives on humanitarian aid and for their key priorities, among other, other issues. Briefly, can you tell us what you found and what, what surprised you? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Erwin, for the question. Um, we uh, uh, at DROPS uh, conduct a, a series of, of, of surveys. Um, we try to do them on a monthly basis uh, across 17 provinces. And uh, the surveys we conducted um, uh, in May in particular, May, July and uh, August. Um, in May, we tried to look at how women were perceiving or accessing humanitarian aid. And uh, we surveyed uh, approximately um, 532 uh, uh, women at that time. And uh, 
the the interesting aspects of our findings was that um, that almost all of our respondents, um, regardless of uh, of employment status or location, expressed challenges in accessing humanitarian assistance. Thirty one percent noted that that no woman in their community were benefiting from assistance, and 50% said that only some women were able to access the necessary aid. And only 0.9% of the respondents said that all women who needed the aid were actually receiving it. Now, this showed to us the barriers to accessing humanitarian assistance are quite high, um, and, and they are dependent on local contexts, and that only some of the aid that is reaching the community, that on, only some of this aid is reaching communities that are, that are uh, uh, mostly in need of it. Uh, but in addition to, to this finding, um, what surprised me in May uh, was when we asked um, our respondents, um, what issues are women in your community most concerned about? Um, we had um, a, a majority selecting unemployment. And then following unemployment was restrictions on women's rights and closure of girls' schools. And I found that quite interesting to be above security, above healthcare, and above feeding family. Um, and then in in the month of uh, of uh, of July, we wanted to take a deeper look into the security conditions on the ground. And this was because there was an emerging narrative among the international community that the Taliban have been able to um, ensure um, or bring about security across the country. We often heard of, uh, of, uh, of aid workers being able to travel across the country and journalists being able to cross a, uh, uh, travel across the country. And, and if you're an international, yes, you can, but it's not the same uh, when it comes uh, to, to Afghans. And when we, when we started asking questions about security, our findings were also, it, it, it was quite interesting. When we asked um, in the last four months, uh, to what extent security has improved in your community? Um, and we surveyed about 2,082 women across 17 provinces. 911 said it had improved a little. And about 344 said no difference. And only about 384 of, of the 2000 women um, surveyed said that it had improved a lot. When we asked which security issues improved the most in your community and which security issues improved the least in your community, interestingly, what, what they said had improved the most was theft and explosions. And then when we said what least improved, it was actually the same two, except now, Explosions were not attributed to the Taliban, but they were attributed to other international terrorist organizations that are more freely operating across the country, particularly ISIS. Um, and that's what we got from the focus groups that we also hold on a monthly basis. For me, it was quite it was it was important to note that that the that the narrative from the international community is a little bit aligned to what we're hearing here in the sense that security has improved a little. So it hasn't improved a lot, just a little. Um, but when we were conducting our focus groups uh, in 11 provinces with 133 women, uh, in there, when we asked them um, and we shared the findings with them and we said, well, security has improved in your community. Is this how you feel as well? They said to us, we don't traditional, if you look at traditional security, yes, but we don't define security uh, in, uh, in, in traditional security terms. We define security as uh, physical security, mental security, and psychological security. And if you look at that definition, we don't have any sense of security. We don't have a sense of security because there is so much uncertainty uh, and the lack of institutions like the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commissions or women-led NGOs or other civil society organizations uh, or judiciary institutions, we don't have anywhere to go if we were to face a problem. This for us um, is a source of, 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 of our mental uh, insecurity that we live with now. That wasn't the case during the, the Republic. And then in the month of, um, in, in August, we surveyed about 2,559 women in 17 provinces. And what I found very interesting in these results was when we asked women what, what their key priorities were for women and girls today. Um, 
979 said women's rights and 571 said access to public services. Then came security, improved access to humanitarian aid and addressing poverty. So it was quite interesting to note that the narrative we often hear from the international community is that citizens of Afghanistan, particularly its women at the subnational level, are concerned about humanitarian access to humanitarian aid. And while this is true, we're not saying that this is not an, an important fact. This is very, very true, as Ms. Zora Wardak also highlighted. But at the same time, women uh, and women women's uh, the full spectrum of women's right is also very critical for Afghan women. And so that's why when women's rights and access to public services is selected above security and improved humanitarian assistance and addressing poverty, it shows to us where the international community also needs to advocate for. Um, and, and for us, uh, also another interesting fact, and I'll stop there, is when we ask them what the international community can do in its engagement with the Taliban on improving conditions for women, um, we found about 26% of our uh, respondents said facilitate for women to talk directly with the Taliban. And another 26% said link international aid to better conditions for women. Um, the rest of our findings um, can be found on Bishnau's website. I'll stop there, but those were some of the really interesting facts that came out of, uh, of, of our survey results uh, these past three months. Okay, thanks so much for that, Mariam. That really helps set us, sets us up for, for some of the conversations we'll have. Um, I'm struck by the, um, you know, the, the, the different perceptions of, of priorities of what, what Afghan women told you. Uh, or your organization, and perhaps assumptions about that, and perhaps the implications of that, um, the practicalities of of you know negotiating with the Taliban, and and you know the the age old question of you know conditioning aid perhaps or or using leverage, um, but uh, we'll we'll get to all of that shortly. Um, Asila Wardak, let's let's turn to you next. Um, you know, I, among those findings early on was the this. Um, uh, the finding that many Afghan women were saying that uh, the, who, who were responding to the survey, at least, were saying that um, they were not seeing aid reach their communities, or at least women in their communities. Um, now, you've talked about how aid programs often treat Afghan women as beneficiaries, not as leaders or implementers. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how women are sidelined when it comes to, to aid programs uh, and what are the impacts of this? Uh, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organization that provided this opportunity for four of us to, to speak. And second, I would like to also thank the donor community, the international community, and every individual that they they stand, to, especially with, with all Afghan, but especially with Afghan women at this crucial, uh, crucial time. I really appreciate it. Um, in terms of your question, I think uh, it's very much important to have a woman uh, in the humanitarian uh, head uh, project. Um, in different perspective, in my view, I think uh, one of the, the, the principles of uh, gender equality is to give equal uh, opportunity to, to women. And in terms of Afghanistan, in, in the Afghanistan context, you know that Afghan women making up the the, the, the more than half of the population in, in the country. And then as uh, Ms. Zohra Wardak mentioned about the, <clears throat> that how much Afghan women, unfortunately, especially after the collapse, that they are now dependent on the, on the head project and then the humanitarian assistance, it's a big number. And it's very much important to, uh, to include uh, women. I have different reason for including women to, uh, as a beneficiary and as a um, uh, project implementer, as, as leader in the, the, the project, because, by including women, we can meet the, the specific uh, need of women in the community. And also um, identifying easily the, the need and priorities of women in a community and, and then, uh, in society. And also we are bringing more accountability and transparency by including women because especially women, they are not corrupt. Uh, they are just investing uh, in their families and, and in the communities and then building uh, uh, their nations. 
So it's very much important to, to give them also the confidence to be part of the project design, the project implementation, and the monitoring and implementation, the, the, at the leadership position, not only beneficiaries, because beneficiaries, of course, they, and also in terms of beneficiary, there are lots of the problems, as, as our colleagues mentioned, and the community, because we do have a big number of widows in the community, and also those uh, male, male uh, companies that they left Afghanistan because of security problem or job opportunity. So women, they are the breadwinner of the, the, the families. We have millions of women that they also lost their jobs. So they're dependent on the humanitarian end. But, 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 but if, we, if we are marginalizing this big um, number of women from the leadership position, from involving of the project, from uh, being the benef direct beneficiaries, they are not allowed to go to the distribution side. So we are adding to more to poverty. That, that's why it's very much important to, to have more uh, women at the um, uh, project design, project planning, and also uh, as a beneficiary. Thanks for that, Asila. I think uh, we'll soon hear some ideas on, on how to do that, hopefully. Um, first, Sophia, I want to turn to you, Sophia Ramya. Um, let's talk about the education um, and you know the, the consequences. What are the consequences of Taliban restrictions on education of women and girls? Uh, let's say for the healthcare situation today, um, and the longer term consequences for the healthcare sector in Afghanistan more broadly. Yeah, thank you so much, Jaron, for the question, and also for giving me the opportunity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those who are joining us online from around the globe. Uh, in the medium term, we will face a further so shortage of women doctors and nurses. Despite the gain in the past 24, uh, 20 years, Afghanistan has one of the highest maternal death rates in the world. And after the, uh, the Taliban take over and their restriction on women's education and also minimum opportunities could further impair women's health and their well-being. Uh, uh, also ten, tens of thousands of educated Afghans, among them professional healthcare professionals, has left Afghanistan after the collapse. And thus, this sector has already been under steps and the Taliban is, uh, restriction is putting more challenge to this um, sector. Uh, and also what's the ta what the Taliban is doing is also challenging their own policies of not uh, allowing women to visit male doctor. While the Taliban impose restriction on women's uh, on women's education which uh, result as a footage of uh, having female doctors unfortunately women will not be allowed to go and visit the, the male doctors and uh, women having not access to health care due to the shortage of the female doctor in hospital will result in higher rate of uh, maternal mortality and also uh, maternal illnesses uh, another impact is the mental health issue we see that um, a, a huge population of Afghan millions of girls who are not able to go to school due to the Taliban's uh, restriction or degrees on women's education. They are already uh, suffering from uh, emotional and psychological uh, issues and uh, not and more restriction on women's uh, education and women uh, studying at the medical uh, uh, will, will further add more uh, population and will have a higher uh, uh, more people having a um, problem with a health issue. The recent publication stated that 47% of women were found to have higher psychological distress. Uh, the provision of health services, including psychiatric services in Afghanistan, has been substantially diminished by the armed conflict. Afghan women are exposed to severe trauma, interpersonal violence, stigma around mental health leads to deprive access to psychological support, access to public facility has also been curtailed since the Taliban has taken over. Another impact is the loss of creativity in the health sector. So women has already been discouraged to, to bring more creativity to the sector. And um, the, the impact will not just remain for women in the long-term male will also suffer from, the, from this consequence of the Taliban's restriction. Men will lose their partner and also they will lose their children. If women are not cared, how they can, can 
intensive raised uh, children and also uh, have a, a have a, a happy family. And uh, if the Taliban does not care about um, uh, a women, so we will they will also Afghans will not have a, um, um, a, a, a family will not be be happy and they will not have a um, a, a healthy family. Uh, what the the Taliban's policy is just uh, crippling the, the whole health sector and what's happening in this sector will not just remain uh, within there, it will also take uh, down uh, all, all part of uh, the, 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 the country and all sectors. Um, the collapse of the health sector will, will also uh, impact the, the economy and also the humanitarian situation that's already been worse. For example, if, if one is not healthy, how they can take participate in the decision-making process, how they can governance and how they can uh, lead their lives. Um, what the Taliban is doing, just a, 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 an insane type of society, I don't know if they are knowing what they are happening, uh, what they are doing, uh, they are either ignorant or they are they have uh, enmity with the people of Afghanistan. And allowing Afghanistan's healthcare system to fall apart will be disastrous, uh, disastrous for for the for Afghanistan in the long term. Thank you, and I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. We'll, we'll come back to you very soon. Um, I just wanted to remind uh, the uh, uh, viewers that they can ask questions, and we'll try to get to those uh, later on in this conversation. And I just want to thank all the panelists because we're basically right on time. So that's that's great. <laughs> and that never really happens. Um, Sophia, let's let's go back to you quickly. Um, you know, as you know, this is um, the purpose of this panel is to, to kind of look at what humanitarian aid looks like through a gendered lens in a country like Afghanistan. So maybe um, you can just tell us your, your, your thoughts. What does a feminist approach to humanitarian action look like in practice in Afghanistan? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, having a, a feminist or women's uh, approach in humanitarian action is important because uh, women and girls are disproportionately uh, affected by conflict, climate, and also social repression. There is a, re there is a regime by Taliban men and for Taliban men. There is no space for women women has been literally removed from the whole society and also they have lost all their rights that they had fought very hard during the republic in practice there should be a, a dedicated and allocated resources only for women and for their needs the donor community should engage with multilateral uh, organization like UN agencies and support local NGOs led by women for the provision of the health services. Local women should be part of each leadership team, executive team, and also uh, all the way to the distribution. Women should be present in decision making and resource allocation, and their organization should receive uh, funding to operate in Afghanistan. Um, always have a, a women um, uh, when meeting with a Taliban. Uh, if having women, uh, local women or women from Afghanistan is risky, then the international community and the donor community should take international uh, women with them. And uh, if the Taliban see you, uh, uh, taking um, a side with women, so um, so be it. Um, if uh, if you think this contradict um, uh, with your principle uh, of uh, being impartial or neut uh, neutrality, I think which I think it doesn't. It should um, we should talk about the prioritization of the principle of humanitarian action at the current context and the current situation of Afghanistan. Um, uh, for me, among the four uh, principles of the humanitarian action is uh, humanity came first. Now we see that uh, Afghan women and girls are suffering. So now the priority should be given to how to end the suffering of these uh, women who has not been in school. And um, um, uh, Impartiality, which which I believe that uh, it does not what taking side with the women and girls in Afghanistan, I believe, will not undermine neutrality and partiality, but simply it will uh, lift and also uh, alleviate the suffering of the uh, the women. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sophia. I think that that really helps set us sets us up for the the next question and the rest of the conversation. Really, um, you know, you talk about women being included as leaders and implementers, decision makers throughout, you know, the the entire spectrum of, of aid. And well, I think we've all seen those Twitter threads with pictures of of who is meeting the Taliban. And generally speaking, it's rarely rarely women. Um, and so, uh, Asila, let's turn to you. You know, you you talked earlier about the importance of of women in the decision making pro process. Why are women missing from these crucial aspects? I think every international donor would say, obviously, yes, they must be. But but you know, it's been more than a year. Um, why are Afghan women still missing from these these crucial aspects? And you know, the the second part of that question would be, what would it look like if women's voices and leadership did have a larger role? in actually designing humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I think in my opinion, I hope I'm not wrong. This is an excuse for the international community and donor community to excluding women from the project design and then from all the aspects. Because um, I have an argument for this. Women from government uh, sector, they have, they have erased. So no women are allowed except the nurses and teachers to work in the government sectors. But 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 luckily women, they have still the privilege to work in the, in, in the uh, UN sectors and international um, uh, NGOs and with uh, local um, uh, organizations. So this is the, the, the leverage that we also have in the international uh, organization and donor community also have. But I really don't know. And then again, I'm emphasizing this is an excuse that donors are making to exclude uh, Afghan women from the uh, project implementation. Because by including uh, women, maybe the, 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 the donors community will think that they are creating more problem for themselves. But this is not true. By, by including more women, as my, my colleagues say, that uh, it is a very good opportunity that all donors that they are meeting their, uh, their project's goal and then objectives by having uh, giving equal access to, uh, to women and, and girls as a beneficiary and then as a uh, project uh, implementers. There are lots of um, good examples. We have one woman activist uh, outside the country in exile. We are doing advocacy for women because maybe a, a small number of women that they left the country, but the rest of women educated, they have PhD degrees, they have master's degree, they are uh, well educated. So they are inside the countries. They should be part of these projects. They should be part of the decision making, not only um, uh, this formality position uh, should be given to women, but they should be really. Uh, and then again, I'm saying that international community have the leverage to push, uh, to pressurize. If there is any problem in terms of Taliban that they don't allow, they have the leverage to pressurize uh, Taliban. I'm not saying that humanitarian assistance project should be politicized, but should be um, used this uh, leverage to include more uh, more women to different uh, uh, projects, and also. Another problem is that uh, uh, women civil society are not giving the chance uh, to implement uh, the, the project. I mean, we do have a big number of uh, uh, civil society organizations that leading uh, by, by uh, very talented women. So they are marginalized. And instead of those women uh, head uh, civil society organization, most of these women projects, they are um, uh, given to, to male uh, headed um, NGOs. So this is also, the, it's another problem that they don't know what's the priority, what is the need of women. They don't have access to direct to, to go to the women beneficiaries at the community level and the families. It's very, um, I mean, culturally, it's it, it always like this in, in, in Afghanistan. But in the past, we have a big number of uh, women uh, local NGOs that they had access to women beneficiaries and then to women in the community. So that's why it's very much important also um, a second uh, thing about um, uh, involvement of women at the political uh, dialogue, this is also job and responsibility of the donor community and UN uh, organization to create a space for uh, Afghan women and girls to sit directly with Taliban and then to raise their voices. Before the collapse, I was um, serving uh, as a director general for uh, UN affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And like me, there were thousands of other women and men at the uh, leadership position. So most of this donor community, they were approaching 
coaching us and then inviting us to sit with other women beneficiaries and then women civil society organization. And then they were creating a space to do kind of dialogue that what's their need, what's their problem in terms of implementation, in terms of registration. But now they should also create this, this platform with a de facto authority to, to create this space for Afghan women to sit. I really don't, this is always my ask that don't talk um, uh, on my behalf. Please let me talk uh, with, with the de facto Taliban and with the donor community. Thank you. Thank you, Asila. Uh, Maryam, let's let's turn back to you. Um, let's follow up on, on, on some of your survey findings. You know, the 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 core one, at least in my mind originally, was that many women were reporting that they weren't really receiving this aid that was supposedly coming in. Um, you know, we've heard some of the reasons for this. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on who can address this and how in, when we're talking about the international community. Um, to be able to help answer that question, what I one of the things I like to do is uh, in, in in August we when we were speaking to um, to, to to women um, at the subnational level in Afghanistan, um, and we wanted to hear from them as to what the international community can do um, with uh, women-led organizations and other civil society actors, um, as well as in, in their own engagements, um, and also what women thought national civil society or INGOs can do. I think it'd be important to, to, to look at where they think that um, uh, some of that um, um, some of that help or what form that help can take. Um, when when we asked um, our respondents what what is required from international actors to better support Afghan women's organizations uh, in Afghanistan, uh, interestingly, um, a large majority, almost half of our respondents said ensure their full mobility. So if there is something that the international community can focus on, it is to help reduce the restrictions that the that by using their leverage, and they do have leverage, and they shouldn't be afraid to use this leverage um, to be able to 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 convince the, the 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 Taliban to to remove the restrictions that prevent women from from leaving their homes and moving about, because ensuring their their full mobility is what. A large group of, of of our respondents said to us uh, was a requirement from international actors as a way to better support Afghan women organizations. Um, and then following that was ensure safe spaces for civic participation. Um, those were the two um, key findings uh, in terms of what they expected. Um, when we asked them what can civil society organizations do to improve conditions for women and girls, so these are national civil society organizations in the country, INGOs as well, um, it was advocate to the Taliban. And so they feel that uh, civil society organizations can advocate to the Taliban on their behalf. Um, and the second uh, 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 factor that they had selected was advise international community to advocate to the Taliban on their behalf. So those are two areas where they think that national civil society organizations and INGOs uh, also can play an important role. Um, to be honest with you, these are some discussions we've had with members of the international community and with the humanitarian community in particular. And oftentimes we are asked for, for resolutions to... Um, to so solutions to problems that that I would hope would actually come from them. Um, uh, in Afghanistan, if there's difficulty in recruiting women to be able to deliver humanitarian aid, then what is an alternative? Um, what what have their lessons learned from other contexts shown to us that they can do to be able to circumvent this problem? Um, there are advisory groups that have been created uh, for OCHA and also for other organizations, uh, both with women inside of the country and those that have recently in the last year have left the country. Um, these women continue to engage with these institutions and provide um, uh, their expertise, um, their knowledge on, on how these processes can be shaped and designed. And that's and that's really important. But but on the side of the humanitarian, the humanitarian community, what it what is it? What tools do they have to be able to um, ensure that there is a very clear um, 
role and also a gender lens and the aid that they distribute and how they distribute that aid. So, so oftentimes I actually want to hear from, from, from them um, rather than us being able to provide, uh, they're on the ground, um, they see the conditions that are there. Um, and so, but I find that our conversations tend to end. Um, um, and I, I see that with the international community, there is leverage that can be used, but Oftentimes, these leverages are so easily circumvented, and I and I can give you an example. And, and these leverages haven't yet shown that they could prove um, uh, um, effective. Uh, there was a travel ban on on Taliban that the UN Security Council members weren't able to agree upon uh, just this past August. So when they weren't able to agree up, upon it, it, it passed the timeline, and therefore no Taliban now is exempt uh, from the travel ban. However, just recently, the Taliban traveled to Doha and they had meetings with U.S. representatives. So we were questioning, how is that possible? Well, we find out that on a case-to-case basis, the Taliban can uh, present their, um, their particular travel requirements and that could be granted to them. So then, so, so where, where, where is the leverage that the international community the UN Security Council, for example, others have where they're actually using it to their full ability? They're, they're not using it, yet they ask us, what leverage can we use? And then oftentimes we find them scratching their heads saying, do we actually have leverage? Well, yeah, you do have leverage. You're not using it. And then you're asking me what the, res- what the solution can be. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a... It's a little bit of a dilemma, and it's, uh, to be very, very honest with you, very frustrating um, uh, for us at times. Thanks for that, Mariam. Um, I think that sets us up well for for some of our, our, our later questions, and I know some uh, listeners, viewers are asking about you know conditionality, leverage, specifically closer to the ground in terms of humanitarian aid, and we'll get to that really quickly. Um, I just wanted to turn to to Zora right now because um, she does work for uh, one of the groups that has prioritized hiring women among international NGOs. Um, Zora, you, you mentioned that forty three percent of your staff in Afghanistan are women. Um, you also talked to me earlier about sort of the difference in perceptions, how Afghan women are viewed from outside the country versus the reality on the ground where you know women are, as you say, 43% of your staff. So something's happening there. Um, can, can you talk a bit about that, about this, this perception, what, what the reality is on the ground? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, one thing which, is, uh, which was very really clear from the beginning, like, uh, for IRC, it is important to have like a gender balance because it's not like to fight for gender equality. It is just a matter of to help equally people uh, who are in the who are in need. And of course, we know that half of the population is women, and they are most well, well they are in most in most uh, vulnerable position, and they are more in need. So that was our strategy. And when we have resumed back our activities. So it was very clear that our all offices will be reopened for men and women equally. And that happened and uh, we, ha- we are working in 12 provinces. We have over 3000 female staff and it's not just in number, it is in meaningful position to take a right decision for themselves and for the fellow citizens who are affected. So, uh, but but we are but we are looking to the situation. So from outside the country, it looks that there is nothing possible and everything is just impossible. But when you are in country, when you are working, then you can see that no, it might need additional efforts. It won't be very challenging, but there is still ways, and we cannot like give up on people of the country who are suffering and who are living in those con- in that country, and um, I would say that I have been in the negotiation with the. Uh, de facto authorities from the uh, ministry level, from deputy minister level up to the provincial level. Whenever we have been in negotiation, the first thing that is coming from the de facto authority is that we need to support women. And they are in support of that idea. And they are asking, like, first, they are asking us, not we are asking them. So it means that it's very important for both sides whether it's international community, head aid actors, or whether it's the authorities, they both are thinking for the benefit of the country people. How can we support them? And uh, with that, 
it uh, whenever our conversation has started, we ended our conversation with a very positive note, and we never had a single no from their side that no, this is not like possible. We don't need this assistance, or we don't need that uh, type of activities. And uh, one thing which was which is very clear that when we are talking about our three thousand staff, so it's not like we have provincial at the provincial level women in leadership position so whether they are head or deputy head of the provincial office uh, our offices and uh, they are meeting the different authorities they are doing the negotiation they are doing the coordination everything is possible they are very positive on that note and uh, even uh, with the deputy minister when we had a conversation so it was about mahram mahram is a male a uh, family member who is who should accompany a woman when they are traveling outside the, their home. And uh, it was very clear that, okay, those women who have mahram, so they have to have mahram. Those who don't have mahram, so we cannot push them to find a mahram. And it's impossible. And this is one of the restrictions, which all of us know, like our colleagues who are right now with me in the panel, that this is the most difficult one because no men will sacrifice their lives for women to continue their job or their study to accompany them outside the home. But we come up with the different alternatives that it's possible uh, to have women in groups to travel at the site and implement the activities. One woman have a mahram, another don't have mahram. They can both go together to implement the activities. And this is something that is very clear for the facto authorities as well, because they knew that this 20 years uh, country uh, the 20 years that uh, the armed conflict, the attacks, this, this exclusions, everything happened. So many women lost their family, male family member, and they are now only them that they are headed and their family, and they don't have any other option. So in that time, when we are doing the negotiation, yes, it's working, and uh, um, they are allowing our women colleagues to work, and it's not the fight for other things. It is just reaching affected population by the by having eight uh, female aid actors and uh, our colleagues were talking about the uh, civil society organizations yes uh, right after collapse we did the perception survey i'm work uh, i'm working uh, as a co-lead for gender and humanitarian working group uh, irc and UN, UN women is like co-lead for that gender and humanitarian working group so at the beginning, we have started perception survey. And that perception survey, it showed that uh, 75, more than 75% of civil society organizations' uh, work have been stopped due to different reasons, like sanction, the um, cash liquidity problems in the country, and other restrictions. And uh, after that, we did a complete uh, uh, research on the women's civil society organizations, that what is their problems and how we can tackle those problems. So that study had list of recommendations. And then that research has been sh uh, shared at, the, at different platforms. And uh, many organizations have changed their approach to have partnership with them to ensure that their operation is back on, in, a, uh, in a normal uh, practice. And also, uh, there was some fund uh, allocated only for those civil society organizations because, because we know that uh, criticality of their role on the ground. They are the one who are uh, can reach to the rural areas, and it's like uh, very good for the localization purpose as well, because uh, that will be like Afghan women supporting Afghan women and like providing aid by Afghan women. So uh, that is also something like uh, we found it uh, very helpful. And uh, right after collapse, so there was another discussion about that resuming back the humanitarian aid activities. Uh, is possible, and then we can think of <coughs> women rights letter. But in that term, we have uh, from GIHA side, gender and humanitarian working group side, we have established woman, Afghan women advisory group for each city. Each city humanitarian country team that all the strategical level decisions are made there. So those Afghan women are participating in different meetings, and one of their uh, role um, is that whenever there is a negotiation with the de facto authorities, so they can go and they can represent um, Afghan women on that table as well. So there is ways of like doing a different, um, different works to just ensure that 
uh, we are reaching the most affected population uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, like example of the education, like right now secondary schools are closed, but when we are looking to the all the um, uh, the areas that we didn't have access, like Helmand province, we know that except Lashkar God, there was no school during these uh, 20 years or less than that. And now we are able like to get access there. So we need to focus until we sorted out the issue of like secondary school <clears throat> to ensure that at least children have uh, access to the primary uh, education that, that they are struggling, they, they, didn't, they didn't have it. And from IRC side, I will say that uh, we have got broader access to the areas, which we called it uh, white areas, where there was no uh, presence of eight actors and there was no um, schools uh, in other um, projects implementation. But right now we are able to do that, in especially with education. So our aim is like, okay, until that issue is sorted out, we can at least give access to the children, including boys and girls, uh, primary school access, uh, which is also something that people of the country is uh, in need of that. I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Zora. Um, I just want to move on to um, uh, to a topic I think that's, that's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, we only have uh, maybe 10 minutes left. Asila, I think you were right. We had a lot to cover. <laughs> um, but the question is about condition conditionality for humanitarian programming. I think everyone has different different views on this. Um, you know, Zura, you talk about you know pushing for access, and that involves negotiation. Um, I think others also want to see what leverage the humanitarian, the, the international community has to be used also for some of the bigger picture issues that that are so top of mind in terms of you know full spectrum of women's rights and, and freedom of movement. Um, so I, I, um, um, I'm wondering, uh, let's, let's go to Sophia for this. Um, you've talked about how the international community can press the Taliban, and you've talked about funding and humanitarian aid as being a one tool. Can you elaborate on that? What kind of conditions do you see and why do you see that working? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, first, I will, I will just uh, briefly uh, share my opinion that uh, the funding should um, the funding should go directly to the people of Afghanistan to, to the women. Uh, therefore, the the funding or the humanitarian it should not be conditioned because if we put more condition, then uh, we don't know how this uh, aid will help the people of Afghanistan and will help uh, their situation. But one thing is important is that the, the funding if the funding good access by the Taliban that could strengthen them and they can uh, oppress more women. Therefore, uh, first, it's important to know that how this funding will be channeled, what would, how we will send this money, who will access this money. Um, I have been hearing from the underground and people uh, who are underground that that the funding that has been sent to Afghanistan are, uh, around 30 to 40 percent has been accessed to the Taliban and they have been uh, uh, have been received by the Taliban, and unfortunately, that all the money that has gone that hasn't been to the uh, to the eligible people, but the Taliban, and that's very risky because uh, we know that already the Taliban are, are uh, putting uh, imposing a lot of restriction and empowering them and receiving more funding. This will uh, will will help them to to further uh, impose restriction. Um, so, how the international community can press the Taliban? There is there are a couple of uh, things that the international community to do. First, they can uh, they should continue to put human rights issue in Afghanistan at the forefront and the center of their mandates and policies. The second is expose globally the Taliban's human rights violation, including their restriction on women's education, engage Afghan women and publicize their, their engagement to the public so that it should send a message to the Taliban that the international communities with the people and the women of Afghanistan and not with the Taliban. Taliban. And the last thing they can do is that uh, they should uh, strengthen their partnership with women and also give more platform to women and hear from women on the ground and also women from um, outside Afghanistan, like, like what uh, you are doing today. And um, uh, uh, working with women and giving platform to women will automatically press the Taliban. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. 
Um, Miriam, what are, what are your thoughts on this? You know, if you, you've talked a little bit about conditionality, conditionality, uh, which I'm struggling to pronounce for some reason. Um, but if if conditions aren't possible with humanitarian assistance, then then what are what are the options? Um, with humanitarian assistance and almost 100% of female-headed households and 95 to 98% of the population are required in need of dire humanitarian assistance. Um, and we have winter approaching again, and it's going to be a very difficult situation. So but, 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 humanit the humanitarian community, on principle, um, do not put conditions um, on that. And I can understand that, that aspect. When it comes to economic aid, however, um, as you can see, the international community has put conditions. Um, and for example, the EU um, has made the full spectrum of women's rights a, a key condition. Um, uh, and uh, we've seen also the discussions with the US and the Taliban on, on the sanctions and the release of Afghanistan's um, uh, uh, money uh, for the central bank for that belongs to Afghanistan. And releasing that, you need... you. you Economic development cannot go to Afghanistan without conditions. Um, one, and they can go to Afghanistan if the Taliban are not recognized. Two, the Taliban cannot be recognized if they continue to place restrictions on human rights and women's rights. Um, and, and, and that's something that the international community has reiterated, and I hope they will continue to reiterate it and enforce it. But I'd like to get back to a point that was earlier made um, by our other panelists. I just want to point out that humanitarian aid cannot replace a vibrant economy. A vibrant economy cannot come about unless you have a political path forward and a structure for governance, which the Taliban have not yet been able to develop. You cannot have a political path forward without the representation or, uh, of Afghan people and what Afghan people want this government to look like. So unless you, you don't have all of these things in place, you won't have a vibrant economy. Um, Afghans uh, in the last two decades have been used to a democratic process uh, in which they have been able to elect their chosen leaders, of course, through elections that have been very, very difficult. I'm not saying nothing was perfect before the fall of the Republic, mind you. We, there's severe challenges, hence we are where we are today. But this is what the, the, the population of Afghanistan, especially when it has a youth bulge, and that youth bulge grew up in these last two decades, or used to. The Taliban believe in electing a leader through a council, and that's it. If you don't create a political path forward where, where, where you bring in the aspirations of all Afghans, Afghans must be able to see their reflection in this political path, then you're not going to have all the other building blocks you need to be able to bring about a vibrant economy. How long are we going to be? Uh, I'm very happy that Ms. Sora Wardak, uh, they're having good conversations with the de facto authorities. I think the de facto authorities would be more than pleased for the humanitarian community to continue to give aid some, to the people to fill starving stomachs, something they should have been able to do but are not able to do. Um, so they want this to continue. And the humanitarian community is quite happy to have access. But let's not mistake that this access is coming at the cost of the rights of, of an entire Afghan population. Let's not, you know, applaud them for it. Uh, so I have this difficulty with the humanitarian community. That, that, that access is there. Great. We're looking for opportunities where we can continue. Great. But don't applaud them for it. Um, Afghans, from the data that we collect on the ground, uh, these Afghans do not do, they live in fear, they live in, in, in dire economic conditions, they live with no security at the present moment, they live with no political future. So this is the, the scenario Afghans are finding themselves in. And so this is what the international community must remember, and they must continue to use their leverages to be able to enforce and put pressure on the Taliban, which they can. Uh, but these days, there's a lot of confusion within the UN Security Council. Um, and there's a lot of discussion around Ukraine that, that's very important. And it takes away 
from all, but but what is happening in Afghanistan? And uh, and I feel that there the 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 lethargy that had set in is continued to set in uh, in the international community. But I hope they don't um, uh, uh, forget that um, Afghanistan is a, is 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 crucial uh, to 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 meeting global uh, uh, issues, and we have to be able to address these issues and continue those um, those those leverages and those conditions, at least on economic aid, if uh, if not in any other area. Thank you. Thank you, Maren. Um We've reached uh, the end of the hour, uh, so I'm just going to ask everyone to maybe sum up a little bit, maybe take one or two minutes. Uh, maybe I can pose each one of you a, a question. Um, and you know, for me, one of the themes from today is is you know how do you create space for Afghan women in practice, when it, whether it's in aid, whether it's face to face with the Taliban. Um, so I'll pose that question, but but do sum up your your you know your your key message that you'd like us to to hear. Um, Asila, can we start with you? Um, what 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 are your key priorities, and and if you have ideas for or a message for how do you actually create space for women in Afghanistan? Um, I think, first of all, um, as I said, that creating the political uh, space for Afghan women to sit with de facto Taliban, as Ms. Zohra said, that it, it's a good news that at least we have a uh, green channel from the de facto that they, they don't have problem. But because maybe uh, because she is, she is coming from Kabul and then from Afghanistan, she has more uh, information rather than me. So it's, it's very much important to create such spaces for uh, Afghan women to be at the project uh, design and also at the table directly with Taliban to talk about their own uh, problem. And also one thing about um, the projects, uh, short-term and mid-term and uh, long-term projects, rather than humanitarian assistance project or economic or head assistance, anything, it shouldn't be donor-driven projects. Most of these projects, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's donor-driven projects, and then it's not meeting the, the, the real need of uh, especially Afghan women and children and girls at the community. So that's why it's important to involve women and girls at the survey level, at the uh, early stage, to, to ask uh, their own uh, priorities, to have more sustainable projects and then more uh, need uh, projects. And also one thing that uh, donor community should also avoid duplications, because in, in some of the area that we can see, it's it's overloaded and then in some other area they totally forgot about minorities about women household families about widows and also about women with disabilities no one is talking about women dis with disability because a, a big number of women still we do have in the country uh with a uh, disability uh, problem these are the, the areas that the international community also should uh, should uh, focus and then last point uh, I would like to also emphasize on those uh, Afghans that they are outside the country because it's, a, it's also the responsibility of the host country to uh, build their own capacity and then to provide more opportunity education-wise, economic projects, especially in, in, in the neighborhood uh, uh, countries. There are a big number of Afghan refugees that they are there and also in the European countries that they need uh, to be helped. Otherwise, uh, we will be having uh, or witnessing more violence uh, cases in Afghan communities community and then more crisis in the Afghan community if you are totally forgot about the uh, refugee um, uh, crisis. And um, um, I, I said last, but it's not last, but I will be trying to, 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 to convey my last message that women of Afghanistan is the, the symbol of the resilience. So it was a joint effort that now we have Sofia, now we have Zohra, the, the young generation. 20 or 25 years back, we had no Sofia, we had no Zohra, the young generation. Men were talking on behalf of them. But now we do have, the, this is an achievement for international community and then for Afghan people also that we do have this generation. It's, it's, it's a good opportunity to give them more chance to be at the leadership position and then implementation partners. Thank you. Thanks so much, Asila. Um, Zohra, why don't we go to you? Um, how do you create room for Afghan women? And uh, you know, your your parting thoughts with about a minute left to go. Sure. Uh, one thing which is very important, we should not forget that Afghanistan context was conservative and it is conservative. And making a space for that is like everyone's responsibility. And we need to have like collective approaches to find that space for Afghan women. It doesn't matter that if we didn't see the tangible results in a minute or a month or a year, we should keep going on. And we cannot give up on women and the country people as well. So that is something very important. And another thing is that millions of uh, 
dollars came to Afghanistan, but still Afghanistan situation is the same and we don't see any changes. So the best thing would be that we should we should look back what did work, what didn't work. And those which didn't work, we need to bring changes in that. And the solution would be like sustainable economy opportunities for women. Yes, right now the country is completely aid dependent and we have to change that, uh, that approach. If we empower women uh, economically, then I'm sure most of the issues would be uh, addressed and uh, they will be like able to uh, work for themselves and for the others too. So that is something that we all need to like with national communities, international community, all should work together to um, to uh, make a way forward for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Zora. Uh, Mariam, let's go to you. Um, I think that um, I would just say that that members of the of the international community and multilateral institutions they have to be um, um, unequivocal in their support for the protection and promotion of the full range of uh, women's rights, women's human rights, in accordance with international human um, international human rights law. Um, swiftly and publicly condemn the adoption the adoption of regressive policies that undermine those rights. Uh, whenever they occur, and express uh, solidarity and support for the work of women human rights defenders, peace builders, journalists, uh, civil society representatives, and hold the perpetrators accountable for any violation of these rights. Um, I would think this, and also I echo what Ms. Zora Wardak said, that we should take the lessons learned from the last two decades um, try not to repeat them, learn from them, and see how we can move forward in creating a peaceful and stable society um, in Afghanistan that reflect local ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. And Sophia, to you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, supporting, giving funding, sending aid would, would help Afghanistan in the short term, but it's not some, something sustainable. Unless we do not have a national dialogue about the future of Afghanistan to talk about how the structure should look like, what should be the, our, uh, talk about our constitution, judicial, and all our, um, um, all the part of the, uh, the, the country. Uh, and <laughs> unless we do not have that dialogue that every part of Afghanistan, all members, including women, minorities, and people from all ethnic group of Afghanistan are not part of it to talk about the future of Afghanistan, then uh, everything that we are doing will, will, will not help Afghanistan in the long term. Therefore, we need a national dialogue that should talk about the future of Afghanistan and women should be uh, an actor in this dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. Um, I think that that about does it. Thank you to all the panelists today for, for your time. Uh, I think it's been a really interesting conversation um, and I really appreciate your perspectives and, and your, unique, your unique perspectives um, and your time. And, and frankly, I think, you know, we, uh, I think I can speak, this is coming from the mainstream media, that, you know, we don't hear these perspectives enough and it's really good to, to, to hear them. So I, I hope we'll continue to hear from you both as well as your colleagues. Um, all right, thank you everyone. Uh, and that concludes the session for now.